And now for our feature presentation. Are you ready? Streaming live around the world, this is Paper Cuts with Brad and Jay. Hey, what a stupid question. <laughs> oh, I've already had two glasses, too, of Tennessee whiskey. Jay, we've done, you've done so good, and you have to muck it up right at the end. <laughs> Jay's gray. He's all gray now. Look at his beard. <laughs> I, mean, I got grayer, right? <laughs> uh, everyone in the chat, thanks for stopping by and enjoying yourselves. We know you did. Let's here with us. <laughs> this evening, author Leslie J. Anderson joins us to talk about the Unmothers. Welcome. The show. Well, happy Friday to all. Thank you once again for joining us for a new episode of Paper Cuts. I'm sure it's hot where you are. <laughs> Jeez, steaming about 110, 120 here. Is that possible? 130? Nah, I don't, I don't think 120, I, I, Jay. I, yeah, 140 Central Ohio. <laughs> yeah, give or take a few degrees. So grab yeah. your drinks and uh, cool off with our show this evening. Leslie J. Anderson's here joining us to talk about the unmothers. Leslie, thanks so much. Is it hot where you are? I think we're in the same state. <laughs> we are, yes. Yeah. Um, it is. Uh, when I got into my car this morning at about 10 o'clock, it was already 102. So, yeah. See, yeah. Brad, it, well, it is hot here in Ohio. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Just yeah, melting. Let's... Everyone's just melting away. It is. You <laughs> probably fry an egg on the. Let's do an experiment right now. Let's go out and try <laughs> fry an egg on the sidewalk. I'll take the camera I'm, with me. We'll go. I'm we'll giving up bug. trying to keep any plant alive, like in my garden. <laughs> yeah. I've nah. given up. Like they You're are dead. a sacrifice now to summer. <laughs> I haven't cut the grass for two weeks. There'll be like cutting dirt. No mm-hmm. reason to yeah. do that. Yeah. <laughs> and plus, now it's football season, and it does not feel That's like right. football season. No, it starts tomorrow. I feel sorry yeah. for them. <laughs> they're going yeah. to be dead tomorrow. Buckeyes play a 3.30 game, and, and they're going to be sweating like crazy out there. So, yeah. <laughs> Well, that was the sports talk uh, part of the show. Leslie, how are you doing? What What are you normally doing on a Friday night besides talking to two dopes with microphones here? Oh, man. Um, I had a very exciting day of work. Uh, currently moving <laughs> offices in 102-degree <laughs> heat so that's nice. fun mm, nice. love that for us um so i think uh before this i was laying face down on the couch and i think my plan for after <laughs> this is to continue to lay face down on the couch yeah there you go i <laughs> may have a popsicle later just, just melt cool it on your popsicle. face yeah, yeah just, just let put it, it, let yeah. it go those are my don't even need it like just melt it on your face yeah. From, the, from the freezer to the couch, that thing's going to be a melty mess. Maybe I'll just get in the freezer. There you there, go. That's... Fill up in there. Yeah. We have yeah. we have windows, a, a big freezer in, in the uh, garage. So I'll just sit in there eating popsicle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's what we're no going to do. That's what we're going to do. It could be an well, idea for your next book, just sitting in a, sitting in a freezer somewhere. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. I like that. Yeah, no, I'm not really a partier. I'm not really a, no. I'm not really a sports person either. Sorry. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a staying at home kind of girl. Yeah. <laughs> I'd rather watch the sports at home. That's, yeah. I'm not that, that age. I don't want to do crowds anymore. I don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't want to be out amongst the people anymore. I don't want, you know, all That's that fair. stuff. So. Yeah. That's fair. My coworkers keep trying to my day job coworkers keep trying to get me to go to Buckeye games, and I'm like, ah. oh, don't do it. You don't want to go to a Buckeye game. They're terrible. No, thank you. Yeah. No, they're they're fun, and I've been to a handful. But the problem is, like, I'm like, oh, great. I'm I'm kind of close. But when you're close, you can't see what's happening at the other end of the of, of oh, the yeah. stadium. So mm-hmm. it's like, shoot. Now I want to get way up there and watch what's going on. So. Plus, it's different with because you don't hear the announcement. We're, we're talking about sports, okay? We're here to talk about. <laughs> we're, talking, we're talking about a book, Jay. <laughs> your your book, book, the unmothers. Here. Yes. <laughs> my, my yes. So this is yes. this is your debut novel, right? Yes, it is. So when it came out earlier this month, right? Yeah, it earlier came out. Uh, yeah, on August sixth. What's the uh, what's the reception been for it so far? Yeah. Um. So far, I have I've been blown away by um. The positive reception people have been um people have been really excited about it uh some of the um criticisms uh, criticisms of it i have actually been like yeah that's fair um that's a like some people don't like it has multiple viewpoints and it has quite a few uh mm-hmm. and some people have found that difficult to follow and i'm like 
that's fair. Yeah, that's, uh, I can see how that would be an issue. But a lot of people, I mean, people have been very kind and very excited about it. Um, yeah, it's been kind of fantastic, honestly. Cool. I was going to bring up the multiple viewpoints since you, mm -hmm. since you went ahead and jumped into it. Uh, you want to give us a little bit of a synopsis of what's going on here for those who have not read it yet? Yeah. Kind of elevator pitch here. Absolutely. Uh, so The Unmothers is uh, about a reporter named Marshall who loses her husband and kind of, um, she doesn't go crazy, but she, she loses herself a little bit. So her editor, in order to kind of kick her back into gear, sends her to a small town to investigate a dumb tabloid story. Kind of just like, hey, go figure your shit out before you come back. Right. Um, <laughs> I did not ask if I could swear on this podcast, so I hope that is okay. No, you're uh, completely good. What? You're okay. not. <laughs> <laughs> so she goes to the small town uh, to investigate this tabloid story of a horse giving birth to a human baby. And mm -hmm. she discovers that that is not the strangest thing that is in this town. And uh, then the bodies start piling up. The bodies hit the floor. <laughs> and the bodies hit the floor. Yeah. That, that like one. National, what, what was the, the one tabloid? National Choir? National mm -hmm. Choir, yeah. 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 That's, that's exactly that's, what I was thinking when okay, I read this. Good, good. Yeah. I, so I wasn't the only one because that's what I thought of when I first read the the whole premise of it. So I loved those when I was a kid yeah. standing at the <laughs> I love the commercials for them. It's like, who's dating who? Right. And who has two heads? What? Yes. Yeah. That's like half, twins fall half in mermaid, love. half man. Yeah. 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 And you had to like know the, all the, the different storylines. It was like a, a, a cryptid like soap romance, opera. basically. Yeah. Soap opera. Right. Exactly. Do they still have those? Like uh, when you're checking I think out? They do. Oh, they're not anymore. No. Not yeah. National Enquirer anymore. Now they're all like, you know, um, what it's is. It's all about the celebrities. Cats, yeah. You know, yeah. that sort of. Yeah. And they were always by like the checkouts because, I mean, that's, of course, when you're waiting, you know, six or seven deep, hey, let's read this and buy it. I try to avoid stores. So I don't know how the checkouts mm -hmm. are anymore. So. Yeah. I have a four year old. Um, so I also try to avoid standing in line. <laughs> Exactly. Because like, I have four minutes to get out of that store. There you I go. will pay the extra for the groceries people to put it in my trunk for me. Same places. Walmart, Kroger, all that stuff. I will. I don't know how we got into this subject too, but um, <laughs> so let's go back to the multiple viewpoints. What I, I, I was interested in that. Where did that concept come, come from? Why did you do it? And how much did you mix yourself up while writing this from all the different viewpoints you were, you were <laughs> Sure. At? Um, I actually like this is hmm, multiple viewpoints is kind of where I always want to write um, right. because it's generally how I think of a story is there's, you know, there's one action, a main action, horse gives birth to a human baby. Uh, mm -hmm. And I really think of a story of like, okay, how is everyone viewing this? How is um, Agatha, the new grandma viewing this? How is the father viewing this? How is Marshall viewing this? Um, and when I'm building a story, that's usually how I do it is, is think of the characters and think of what they're experiencing and then choose mm -hmm. which plot points would be most interesting. Um, so actually I am, my work in progress right now has one viewpoint and I'm finding it difficult. I want to <laughs> be in someone else's head real bad. Uh, I don't know what that says about what's going on in my head, but uh, <laughs> That is how I think of it, um, is, is just a series of different viewpoints that sort of come together into one cohesive story. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think it's I think it's interesting that some of the horror people who read it had difficulty with the multiple viewpoints, because I feel like fantasy books, mm -hmm. most of those are multiple viewpoints. So I think it's interesting, the different genres and how the stories are told, either from one perspective or multiple. Like I guess most horror readers aren't used to multiple viewpoints, it seems like. I think it's a preference. Um, mm -hmm. You know, some people like different points of view over, you know, some people can't handle third person point of view and right. some people hate time skips. Uh, I yeah. think it's a valid preference. I love it. I, I also love I it in read. I do too. I think it's yeah. so fun and it just shakes up the story so much. Um, and mm -hmm. I, I always love looking at how a single event can totally change from person to person, like right. how they react to it, their interpretation of it. I just always think that's fascinating. Right. I, I don't read fantasy at all, but I, I enjoyed the, the multiple viewpoints and I love time skips, all that stuff. Anything that would break up the story from the norm 
that's what I look what I look for. Whether it's horror, grit, lit, whatever. I don't read fantasy, so I don't know if that's what happens in fantasy, but that's what stuck out the most with me. Yeah, I tend to agree. Um, I think also like if you read a ton that those sort of experimental things yeah. stick out more to you. Um, mm -hmm. you know, if you're it may not be a good introduction to the genre if you don't tend right, to right. horror, it, it might be a little jarring. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How long did it take you to, like, did you have to narrow it down? Did you have like a bunch more viewpoints and cut some out or? I actually had to like, add oh, some. You had to add some? Okay. <laughs> I ended up adding some after, um, had a great, uh, I was lucky enough to get a really wonderful editor at Quirk, um, mm -hmm. Rebecca, Rebecca Gyllenhaal. And um, she suggested adding two. So I believe okay. it was Jake and um, who else did I add? Oh, um, Jason. Jake and Jason both okay. got okay. Uh, viewpoints. And I really, I loved working with Rebecca because I never felt like she was changing the heart of the book mm -hmm, or mm -hmm. the themes or it, that was always her. Like she got it right away and she wanted to maintain that. And every addition or subtraction she suggested just augmented that and just made it more powerful. So uh -huh. as soon as she explained her reason for those two viewpoints, I was like, oh, absolutely. That makes complete sense. Um, so yes, I actually ended up adding more viewpoints than I had originally. <laughs> Heidi's got a question for you in the chat. Wants to know if it's, would you consider it folk horror? Absolutely. Um, yeah. I think folk horror is, you know, in its very basic folk horror is, ah, trees are scary. Uh, but I think that in a more complicated way, it's, um, there's a way that we do things just in mm -hmm. case, uh, oh, someone yeah. didn't do things correctly. And now we're going to find out what happened. Like, okay. Mm -hmm. What happens yeah. when you don't do things as they should be done? So yes, I absolutely folk horror. I was going to ask you about that. I got, I got some superstition stuff out of, and horses, yeah. by the way, Heidi, there's horses. horses yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I was going to ask. I was a horse there... girl in in okay. high school so that that is in there a lot did you have your own pony <laughs> <laughs> yeah my family had horses um yeah. i i grew up in michigan um mm -hmm. oh and, come on <laughs> <laughs> oh i know Ugh. um I, i'll really break your heart and tell you that my mom taught at university of michigan oh, oh no, jay Sorry. jay's gonna cry himself to sleep at night <laughs> Sorry. um i left though i left that that, that, that counts for something yeah, yeah that, that does um, count but yeah, so so in Michigan, it's a little bit different. In Ohio, it's it's really hard to find a place to ride that's affordable at all. Yeah. In Michigan, mm -hmm. it's one of the most horse populated states because a lot of people have backyard horses. Um, you need mm -hmm. like one acre per horse and you need a water source. You can provide oh. the water source through a trough. So like a lot of people are in 4-H um, or yeah. are in the Young Farmers of America and they have horses in their backyard. And so I had a lot of opportunities to ride these horses. Um, mm -hmm. and we kept our horses at somebody else's farm. Yeah. And so, yes, I did not have a pony. I had a <laughs> track thoroughbred uh, named Tristan. I, I think, it, I think it matters where you live here in Ohio because my wife's family is uh, Southern Ohio. So that's, they have horses for my kids to ride. So, and they're in 4-H and all that stuff. I, me being a city boy, I have no clue what's going on. <laughs> I'm the outcast down there, but yeah, I think Southern Ohio, there's a lot of horses. Just bring Northern carrots. Northern Ohio is just about traffic and gangs. So, gangs. <laughs> I don't know if that's true, but depends on what part so of Ohio. How... Yes. <laughs> so I'm I'm assuming all of your experience with horses that went a great deal to writing this novel for you. All the all the details about the horses and all that kind of stuff. Did you have to do much research on your own, or just bringing all that experience with you? My main research. I just brought the experience for horses. It was mostly like oh, I, let me make sure that I've got this term right. And, you know, mm -hmm. quickly Googling it. The, my main research for the book was um, I do touch on the opioid crisis. Mm -hmm. And it was mm -hmm. very, very important to me that I did that in a respectful way. Right. Um, I didn't, I think it's very easy, especially in a horror book, to demonize that population um, and that uh, addiction. And I really did not want to do that. I wanted to treat people respectfully and mm -hmm. it's such an issue even, even in northern columbus um that i i really wanted to understand it completely before i wrote about it so that was where mm -hmm. for for this book that was my main research 
Right. Okay. Um, as far as the horse stuff goes, yeah, that just was all for my brain. <laughs> what? Why? Why horses for the book? Was that just? Is that where the idea started from? The the horse having a baby, or? Yes, it did start from that. Um, okay. I cannot tell you why, honestly. It was a thought <laughs> that popped in my head, and I was like, yeah, that's weird. Let's, weird. Let's do that. Um, but <laughs> as far as horses, I've written um, quite a few short stories. Um, okay. I, I believe one of them was in Nightmare Magazine. I think another one was in Apex um, mm-hmm. that had horror horses because people are afraid of horses. And as somebody who understands horses, you should be afraid of horses. They're freaking scary. <laughs> They're megafauna. They can smush you with their hooves. Yeah. Like they, <laughs> they are scary. Um, and a lot of people don't understand them. A lot of people feel a huge disconnect um, mm-hmm. from farm life in general, but especially from like horses, which are, you know, a little bit alien. They look a little bit alien. They don't really look like the kind of animals that we interact with on a day. So I do feel mm-hmm. a little bit like I'm cheating kind of with the weird deer thing that you often see in, in horror. Yeah. Deer are a little bit creepy. They're a little bit other. Um, the same thing with with horses, and I wanted to just play with that and really sort of tease it out. Yeah, I feel like people who have never been around horses don't realize how big horses actually are. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I the, my first job was at a stable. No one's surprised. And uh, <laughs> when I was first dating my husband, um, he went to pick me up from my job, and I was letting the horses out, and one of them turned around, and decided to charge me. And I just, you know, put my hand up in the air and made noises and they turned around and left. And I, I turned around and my then boyfriend, now husband, just sheet white, like eyes. <laughs> like, and he's just like, what did you just do? <laughs> <laughs> and later he was like, you know, most people are afraid of horses, right? Like it's normal to be afraid of horses. Uh, yeah. You're like the shaman just telling it to stop. Right. I was, yes. Like, be gone. So big. They are. Huge. They really, really are. And I'm lucky right. that like I I did not get seriously injured during my mm-hmm. uh like 10, 15 years working with horses. I did get often injured, but not seriously injured. That's good. <laughs> so I want I want to go back to the the superstitions really quick, because there are yeah. some superstitions in the book, like um milk and, and sugar on the graves and not going into the fog and stuff. So how did the superstitions for your story, how did those influence the actions of the the citizens of, of rayford while you're writing it and I, I learned some new ones too by the way from reading this well, i didn't know that. i didn't I know a lot up, of these so. and some of them are actual appalachian okay like mm-hmm. superstitions um and uh one of the thing one of the things i've noticed with you know there's there's a lot of essays written about the ties between um scotland ireland and appalachia um and one thing I've noticed about both of those groups of people is that they kind of feel the same way about their superstitions. Like they believe very deeply in them, um, in that they follow them, but also they'll be like, but we don't really believe that. Like I had yeah. a friend who was visiting from Ireland and he's like, I don't believe banshees are real, but if I hear something outside at night, I'm not going to go outside. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> uh, and the same thing with my Appalachian friends who are like, if you, I, I don't believe that there are unpeople outside, but if you hear whistling at night, do not go outside. Like just in case. Mm-hmm. Um, so like passing a baby around table leg, that is a real one. Um, that yeah. uh, the belief is that it helps with colic. Uh, obviously the iron over the doorway, that's a pretty well known one. Uh, the mm-hmm. sugar on the gravestone, I made up. That is, that is totally me. Um, the monster is, is made up. That is also totally me. So I, I, I have a combination of, of actual beliefs in there and, um, and my own superstitions. But I think what differentiates Rayford from maybe real Appalachia is they don't, it's not just a just in case. They are living their lives kind of trapped by those superstitions, um, yeah. even as they kind of give lip service to the fact that they don't believe them. Right. Mm-hmm. So what are you going, what are you going to do when when people take the made up ones and, and they start catching on <laughs> and you're going to hear about it like in five years so it'll get back to you like oh wait a second yeah <laughs> I should oh get credit God, for I this one happens. I yeah. really hope that happens <laughs> that'd be cool. that would be incredible <laughs> I will be excited I do, think funny, I, I do think it's funny like we do the superstitions and don't even think about it. like knock on wood and like you know if you break a mirror you get seven years of bad luck like everyone I think subconsciously does those but not even really thinking that they're superstitions. So I think yeah. it's just kind of part of you know, our society, the superstitious stuff. And, you know, you have your own 
in this story as well. I, th- I don't know. I think it's it adds to making the place feel more realistic. Yeah. Walking under a ladder, the black mm-hmm. cat, yeah. all the all that stuff. Yeah. yeah it's just it's almost second that. nature to people. Just you just see it and like don't do that. Yeah. You don't even think and about yours, it. Just... Yours is gonna catch on. The ones you made up's gonna catch on. You're gonna go to grave sites and see <laughs> <laughs> milk like and sugar. <laughs> milk and sugar on top of some of the graves. Like that would be when I was in high school. <laughs> I got, I used to, I was in tech crew because I was a dork. Um, <laughs> sorry, tech crew people. We are all dorks. And I made up this story because I was bored about um, a ghost in the theater of a kid mm-hmm. who had like fallen into the orchestra pit and died. And um, <laughs> five years later, I went back to pick up my little brother from the same high school. And he goes, did you hear about the ghost in the theater? <laughs> and like, nice. That's so awesome. proud proudest i was so proud so like yes i hope that they, that that lives on in the same way that's fucking great so yeah. you, you've you've already started the what is it urban the urban legends yeah. yes yeah i gave him a name he had the same name his name was kevin he kept that name <laughs> he died in the same way like it was pretty good that's great yeah that was maybe my first ghost story there you go all the way back to high school so I wanted to, uh, so the beginning of the book, like not even the first chapter, but I guess I wouldn't call it a prologue, but you know, at the beginning it talks about um, like the different myths from like ancient society about where horses come from the sea and stuff. And you specifically mentioned, you know, Rayford's not by the sea, that maybe the horses from there come from somewhere else. So like, did you, going through that kind of, I guess, creation process for horses, did that help influence the book or sort of lead it on its path where the monster came from or anything like that? The different superstitions and things they have? Yeah. I mean, I think that's kind of the, um, the heart of this book is sort of where that monster comes from, where the horses come from, where like all of this comes from. Um, Mm -hmm. and the answer more or less is, is the rage of, of the women of the town and the powerlessness of them. Um, Mm -hmm. which kind of gets manifested in a lot of unfortunate ways. Um, But part of, part of that whole issue, which is in that tiny, you know, mini prologue is, is the unspoken part of it. Like where did the horses Mm -hmm. come from? Nobody knows. There isn't a myth. There isn't an explanation for it. Nobody's talking about it. Um, It's a secret simply because no one is talking about it. Um, Nobody Mm -hmm. brings it up in the same way that like the monster is a secret because no one's talking about it and the suffering of these families is a secret simply because no one is talking about it but everybody knows Uh, so yeah i think that that was kind of a parallel that i was trying to draw of the things that we discuss and the stories that we tell kind of define where we are and if you don't define where they are they just become mysteries um, and spooky Mm -hmm. mysteries sometimes I thought it was interesting that like all the women in town, you know, it's been handed down generation to generation. They know about the ritual and all the secret stuff. And the men are, they kind of maybe know about the monster, but then they seem to kind of forget about it if it's not like in front of them. So is that like important as well to yeah. have it where the, the men don't really kind of know what's going on, but not really. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, and then that's again, the like, none of them just ask like, mm-hmm. Um, even daily when he does ask, he asks in like a threatening way that makes yeah. Emma really not want to tell him. Um, right. but mm-hmm. any of these guys could have just asked, like nobody just asks, no one just talks about like, Hey, um, uh, men, men are stubborn. Just so you know this or not, <laughs> men are stubborn. They don't want to ask for directions. So they're not going to ask for something they should know about. I have so. heard that, but I think that there's a lot of like women things that men don't know anything about. And also mm-hmm. are kind of uncurious about. Um, I remember when I was getting ready to give birth to my son, and uh, my husband and I were uh, taking a tour of the maternity ward with a bunch of other couples. And um, you know, rapid, we're all rapid fire asking questions, and then one of the guys just goes like, "You guys are asking all these questions, and I don't know what any of this is." And then sort of like <laughs> looks at us like we're supposed to like be like, "Ha ha, you're so funny and edgy." Yeah. But like we're all looking at him like you're an idiot. Like, why aren't you curious about this life-changing experience that's about to happen? 
Um, yeah. And I, yeah, I think I've had that. I think most women have had that experience where, you know, they'll be like, well, why don't you just, why don't you just hold a period like P or something? And it's like, okay, okay. The level <laughs> that I need to explain at this point, like <laughs> just, you know, just no cure, no curiosity. And then that sort of like ignorance comes out. Right. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I think that I, that's... I show I show my ignorance. I'm I'm the only guy in my house. I have two daughters and my wife. So I'm like I am I'm I'm beat. I have to ask. I'm like I. I bet like, you've caught on to some things though. You've no, I, I have patterns that by, I have by my second kid. I've learned from the first kid and from the <laughs> wife. So it's just, you know, but some I still do the whole. That's a mom question. She'll be home in about an hour. <laughs> so yeah, that's fair. That's fair. Yeah, for sure. So uh, before you wrote this book, you have some poetry stuff out there too, correct? Some poetry collections. Yeah. Are those horror as well or are they, are they separate? Some of the poems are horror. Um, They Mm -hmm. are, uh, I tend to describe them as speculative poetry uh, because I do horror fantasy, science fiction poetry, some personal poetry as well. Uh, Mm -hmm. But yes, there are some horror poems in there. Um, And I've had some horror poems published in, in horror magazines and anthologies too. What is your uh, writing process? Go ahead. Sorry. I'm sorry. I was, I was just going to say the two books are um, An Inheritance of Stone, which sadly is no longer in print uh, because the publisher is no longer uh, publishing and um, Take This to Space, which is available. Okay. So like your, uh, your writing process from poetry to like a prose novel like this, do you approach that differently or do you kind of go into it with the same mindset? I used to approach it differently. Uh, this is not mm-hmm. the first novel I've, I've finished. Um, it mm-hmm. is the first novel to be published. Uh, yeah. Hopefully more to come. Uh, <laughs> fingers crossed. But, yeah, fingers crossed. I think I, I really approached, I was like, oh, fiction is totally different. I'm going to approach it from a plot centric mm-hmm. point of view. Um, mm-hmm. And I don't, I think that is why, uh, well, I mean, there's probably lots of reasons. I probably got better at writing, uh, but I do think that that was a weakness in like the first couple books that I tried to write was that they were very plot focused and Mm -hmm. I was not using my, my skill, my main skill, which was language. Um, And not this book, but, but a a previous book that I finished, which was the first one that got me talking to my agent. Um, Mm -hmm. It, I really gave myself permission to just be a poet on the page. Um, to just play with language and to build the build a world and kind of just wander around in it and see what I bumped Mm -hmm. into. Uh, And I loved it. It was so much fun. And I really have to thank uh, Jeff Vandermeer for that one. Uh, Reading his uh, Annihilation. He does Mm -hmm. that. He is he's built a world and he kind of just walks around in it and talks about it. And it's creepy and beautiful and poetic. And I'm like, Oh, you can do this. You're allowed to just do this. Yeah. This is awesome. Uh, so I approach both kind of similar uh, at this point in that, what do what, what kind of language, what kind of theme do I want to play around with and wander around in and, and look at stuff like what kind of museum do I want to build? Right. Um, uh-huh. So yeah, more, I'm getting more and more similar uh, instead of further and further away from, from, the two writing processes right i mean this like may it, sound weird but i, I could kind of tell i i knew because i'm doing research for the show but i could read in the book i could tell the way some of the uh, sentences were structured the way you manipulated certain words certain places that you probably did poetry before does, does that make sense because i mean yeah. I, I i do the same thing where you, you can manipulate sentences certain ways and the structure have it set up a certain way you reverse words and normally that you see that when someone who does other things outside of just writing these stories over and over. So I think it's kind of a, like when you see a football player take some ballet, um, yeah, yeah. when you like, when you're really paying attention to the individual muscles and like the individual steps that you're taking, like you have to in poetry because right. you have a tiny amount of space, it changes mm-hmm. how you write when you have a great big field in front of you. Right. Right. Yeah. Okay. So that did, that did make sense to you. I know I, yeah. <laughs> people listening are like, "What the hell is he talking about?" <laughs> yes, I I know like, exactly I, what you mean. Okay, okay, good. I would, for me personally, I would much rather read a book with just beautiful prose, and even if the characters sat in a room the whole time, I'd much rather read that than like plot heavy, bunch of yeah. action and stuff. I don't. For me personally, I just I love when people write really pretty prose. 
And again, if as long as it's pretty and interesting, I could the characters should just talk the whole book yeah. and I would be like, Yeah, this is great. And nothing could ever happen. Yeah. I have moods. I go back and forth. Uh I I'm currently actually reading Crown of uh no, wait. Yeah. Um Throne of Thorns? Throne of Rose of Thor I'm sorry. I think it's, it's Crown a, of Thorns, right? Is that what it is? It I, I don't. I'm sorry. It's a, a fantasy <laughs> romance, and it's just all action. Like it's just action, action, it? action, action. Like it's moving so fast, and I'm enjoying that. And I will probably do a very like verbose, prosy book next to have like a totally different feeling. I like them both. All books are good books. <laughs> that, there you go. When you were um. I don't know. I, I listened to Stephen King's on writing recently. So this is kind of where my questions come from. And he was talking about like on your first draft, you just kind of spit it all out. And then when you go back, that's when you kind of discover what your themes are and then you know, build upon that when you're going through your second draft. So with this, did you go into this book kind of wanting to hit the themes of like the opioid uh, epidemic and like uh, teen pregnancy and like kind of the rural small town uh, kind of the plights that they're going through? Was that like your intention going in or was that more, going back through, it's like, oh, I've kind of hinted on these a little bit. Let's, let's build these up a bit more. Yeah. I think I, I diverge from uh, Mr. King's writing advice a little bit. I, I uh -huh. think I do it from sort of theme and vibe first. Um, mm -hmm. I know what I want to talk about and in the world in which I want to do that in. Um, mm -hmm. And then I will build, you know, the, the plot a little bit more. Um, but I will say now that I like, am I have connections with like publishers and an agent, I have had to dramatically change how I do that because they're not interested in vibes at all. Yeah. Uh, I can't be like, Hey, I kind of want to write a book that feels like this, or I want to write a book that's on an Island or like, how about a haunted castle? They do not care. Uh, <laughs> they would like to see a plot. And yeah, okay. uh, like characters and ideas. And so I've had to uh, bully my poor brain into doing okay. that um, for, you know, if I would like to do another book, which I would really, really like to do another book. Uh, so I have, I have changed dramatically how I do my books now um, as I am having to pitch or change or edit or plan or be in a discussion um, mm -hmm. with a publisher. So we'll see how that goes. Um, but it has been a really wonderful exercise as a writer uh, in mm -hmm. thinking about a book in a different way. Did you have to go through that same thing with Unmothers? The Unmothers? No, Unmothers, uh, Unmothers I, was 100% came from vibes and then I okay. built the plot around it. Um, so it worked. Uh, but then they're like, hey, would you like to write another book with us? And I'm like, absolutely, I would like to write another book with, that, with uh, you. And they were like, okay, great, give us an outline. And I'm like, <laughs> I haven't written the book yet. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, you know, obviously it will change and they're very open to being elastic. And, uh, but, but having to sit down and be like, okay, plot, here we go, um, was a very weird and, and honestly kind of cool exercise like once right. i got past the like i can't do this there's no way this is not how my brain works what they once i told that voice to shut up uh, uh -huh. it was a really cool way to challenge myself and make myself think of a book differently do you think that'll make it easier going forward to to pitch and write other books it's kind of absolutely your... okay. yeah i think if i can do if i can combine the two if i can keep that um poetic uh, approach that vibe that like feeling um mm -hmm. which i think is easy because you know it's very naturally how i do things but i can also attach it to this like thought more about pacing and plot i think that it can only improve it um uh -huh. you know i hope that's my hope uh but yeah i think it will change how i do books going forward uh and i hope that overall it 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 ends up being a good thing yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. With, with with those specific themes you personally, what were you wanting to to say or make statements about within the sort of structure of the unmothers, like the opioid sure. and, you know, not necessarily even teen pregnancy, but just kind of pregnancy in general and like small town America, how it's kind of, I mean, I think in the beginning of the book, you mentioned like the factory had gone out. So like pretty much all that was left was the horse industry. So just kind of how that's kind of crumbling small town America and stuff. Yeah. Um, so 
a big loaded question for you. <laughs> a lot of questions. Yeah. I'm trying to it's think. Got deep on a Friday like, night, Brad. <laughs> I mean, as far as like small town goes, um, I mean, I was I was born in Detroit, and people from Detroit will go, "Were you born in Detroit, or were you, like out like out?" And I go, "I was born at Henry Ford Hospital," and they go, "Oh, Detroit, Detroit, yeah, like, <laughs> the middle of Detroit." Um, and then yeah. we moved to New Hudson, which is a tiny. It was not anymore, but it was a tiny, tiny agricultural town. It had like one stoplight, a store, like a grocery store, uh, a gas station, and for some reason, a video rental place. Um, <laughs> But I, I miss video rental places. I miss them. Me too. And that one was like one of the like, you know, no straight walls, no good lighting, like sh super shady. Like, where did yeah. you get these? Did they fall off a truck? You know, well, perfect. <laughs> had this special room in the back. for those Oh, yes. Kind of, Heated curtain kind of the whole yeah. nine yards. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> uh, yeah, formative. Absolutely. Um, so, and then I, um, I, learned to ride in another small agricultural town, South Lyon. And I spent just, I mean, innumerable hours at the stable. I lived there. Like I went to school and I hung out at the stable. That's what I did for basically like mm -hmm. 15, 20, first like 20 years of my, like that was home. Um, and I uh, saw firsthand these small towns that relied on maybe one or two businesses. And for, mm -hmm. I mean, Detroit too, you know, relied yeah. on the automobile industry. And once it left, you know, crumbled right. um, and full of just incredibly proud, hardworking people who could not get their feet under them um, mm -hmm. and yet continued to be proud, hardworking people. And I, I really, you know, I idolized a lot of them and I saw that their struggles and I also saw things that they struggled with that were of their own making. Um, a lot of times simply not being able to communicate or to accept or give help um, in the way that the characters are uh, in the book. As, as far yes. as motherhood <laughs> and pregnancy, um, I wrote this book while I was pregnant and while many of my friends were getting pregnant. And um, a lot of us were really mad mm -hmm. uh, for a lot of reasons, uh, one of which is Nobody told us a lot of the stuff about being pregnant. And I know a lot of people are going to roll their eyes out at that. But like, did you know that your hip can dislocate while you're pregnant because your ligaments loosen? I didn't know that until my hip dislocated. Yeah. Well, my teacher or my uh, teacher, my doctor was like, yeah, that's normal. That's a normal thing that can happen. So you just and hobble it, and around. He just waves it off. Like, yeah, yeah. It, it, it's, it's just a normal thing. You know? It's a normal thing. And it was that stuff always like like every appointment i was like this hurts this isn't like i can't close my hands anymore they're like yeah it's carpal tunnel you know again your muscles and ligaments uh loosen i mean people at my job treating me different friends treating me different people on the street treating me like it was infuriating um mm -hmm. it was infuriating and it was in many ways kind of a body horror experience too like you you really kind of lose control uh in the way that you are used to um, mm -hmm. very glad I did it. Love my son very much. Furious that our culture seems incapable of having an honest conversation about mm -hmm. childbirth and pregnancy. Um, and, and seeing people get like incredibly uncomfortable when I would try to have those conversations or even make offhanded comments. Um, uh -huh. like I remember at one point, uh, a bunch of my coworkers are going to do an ax throwing thing. And I said like, oh man, I want to go to that. I could, I could use it to like work off some anger. And they're like, oh, what do you have to be angry about? And I'm like, <laughs> I don't know. The fact that none of my shoes fit because my feet <laughs> grew three sizes and my spine is literally changing shape. Mm -hmm. That seems like enough reasons. So <laughs> uh, yeah, I just, I wanted to write an angry book about pregnancy. Uh, uh -huh. And I wanted to write an angry book about small towns. And it seems like those two went together very, very well. <laughs> Did you find yourself like angry typing too? Like, yeah. Damn it. <laughs> yeah. There were some times when writing this book felt a little bit like an exorcism. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> I couldn't go to axe throwing. So I was going to get it out somehow. <laughs> right. What, what, uh, what small town in Ohio is Rayford like based after? There's got to be some place. You know, I'm, I'm thinking of one. It, it's, you're thinking of one. Yeah. 
I, I bet you've never heard of it. Um, but I used to, uh, I went to graduate school at Ohio University okay. and, and taught Valley there Athens. for a, yeah. a hot second. Um, and just outside of Athens is a town called Shade, mm -hmm. Ohio. I and that it's... was when I tried to think of like the map of Rayford. Okay. That is what I pictured with Shade, yeah. Ohio. Do you remember the uh, radio station in Athens, Power 105? Yeah. I was a program director there for like two and a half years. Awesome. <laughs> well, I, I know the whole area. I, I know that. Yeah. Yeah. My uh, my dad went there and an aunt on both sides went there. And so we were very confused because he kept telling me about the river. You know, be careful when the river floods. Uh, yeah. Don't go south when the river floods. And the river is like now a, a half mile south of campus. So yeah. I've, I had no idea. What he was talking about. Well, I lived on the <laughs> river too. I, I, I because I, I worked at a radio station over in Parkersburg, West Virginia. So I lived in Belpre, Ohio, and Belpre, Ohio is what I'm thinking of for Rafer because it's that got. Was, I mean, yeah, I can also yeah, see that. Yeah, it's got the sure. one, the one uh, traffic light, and it's got like it had like a uh, like one furniture store, one quickie lube oil place for your car, one grocery store, and it was just like I didn't know how to act <laughs> moving from Columbus down there to work. I didn't know how to act, you know. I'm like, well, where, where's the store for this? And they had the, the video <laughs> store with the special room in the back, yep. all that stuff. So, absolutely, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I kind of feel a little bit at home in Athens. I have to say, in that yeah. area, like I was like, oh, I, I get this. I, I, I got the vibe. I get what yeah. we're, we're putting down. Well, Athens is, is OU and nothing else. <laughs> so, that is true. Yes. Yeah. Um, and oh, oh man, that it, it sure is a college uh, Saturday. Sunday mornings, cleaning the broken Sunday glass mornings has got that, that smelly puke smell oh, all over. Just, yep. <laughs> yeah. Especially yeah, around I, Halloween. Yeah. The I Halloween parties. Of like walking downtown and seeing your students and being like, I, I don't think you're going to have your essay tomorrow. Uh, we'll talk about it later, I guess. Yeah. I did. We, I, oh, maybe I should be telling the story, but I'm going to anyway. Uh, so we would, the, <laughs> the teachers and grad students would go do karaoke at the Smiling Skull, uh -huh. uh, which is the biker bar down the hill. And um, I did a Ch Dixie Chicks Cowboy Take Me Away, and I think I nailed it. And I got <laughs> off, off the stage, and there was an entire table full of my students. Nice. The oh, man. <laughs> and I like made eye contact with them. I'm like, none of you are 21. So this didn't happen. And I but was it, like, <laughs> again, it's, it's Athens. It's, it's just a college town. Yep. They Nobody cares. Maybe they had fake IDs. Maybe they didn't. Most places around there didn't care. Only it, Tony's it, it, checks IDs because yeah. Tony's doesn't want to deal with undergrads. Right. Yeah. See, I, it, it was weird when I was working there and I had to go out and do these appearances. It was different because I went to Otterbein and it was a dry area. Oh, Western yeah. at the time. Yeah, it was all just totally dry when I went, you know, back in the late nine <laughs> 1900s. Yeah. <laughs> my, my kid calls it the late 1900s. But yeah, when I went, Otterbein, it was like totally dry. That area was dry. And, all. and I was working in radio. And I was down in Athens. It was just nonstop parties. And stuff. I had to go to these parties because I was working in radio. I'm like, it's I missed this college life. This is what I miss by going to a different school. <laughs> oh, my God. I didn't. I, I was not that type of student in undergrad. I was not that type of grad student. No. I was totally unprepared for it. <laughs> yeah. I'm a tea. I'm a tea and fireplace kind of like a book. A book in a fire that's that's my jam yeah. i am not a throwing broken bottles into the street nah. <laughs> brad you know nothing about these places do you or sure do you feel left out <laughs> yeah <laughs> no i don't feel left out because i'm in kentucky so i'm used to small towns and stuff too so yeah. right so rayford's just the whole state of kentucky basically <laughs> except except Louisville, yeah. and Lexington, everything else is tiny. The, yeah. whole, the whole state's got one traffic light, and one... <laughs> yeah. me and Laurel share the, sa share the same phone yeah. line. Yeah, you and Laurel Hightower <laughs> share the same internet connection. So, <laughs> so with uh, you know the the rage you had with this book, do you feel like you'll did you get all that rage out, or do you feel like any yeah, other no. coming uh, book more rage? Well. Are you, well you going to write rage. more book? <laughs> Are any more books going to be about pregnancy too, or is this going to be your pregnancy book? No, I think I, maybe not specifically in this way, um, mm -hmm. but I do want to keep, I wasn't sure if I wanted to, but so many people have reacted to this book uh, in a way that's like, this, this makes sense to me. Like I felt this mm -hmm. way or like, 
I don't feel like I've read about these kind of characters or these kind of like issues. And I think that that's happening, you know, more and more people are writing about these sort of things. Um, mm -hmm. But a lot of, in a lot of ways, horror about pregnancy in the past was very much like a community fear of horror. Like even Rosemary's Baby. I was gonna say, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, it's sort of like a looking into this pregnancy. Um, it's mm -hmm. not as much of like the parenthood and pregnancy. You get it a little bit with like um, Damien, that sort of thing, right. like the the creepy child sort of of uh you know, there's that scene where like the dad is like trying to kill him and he can't and he's like he bursts into tears. Like that's the sort of thing I think that I would like to explore more. Um so maybe mm -hmm. not necessarily like the physicality of pregnancy, um, right. the actual like being pregnant, but I I would I would like to continue to write about um motherhood and parenthood and creepy ass children. Um <laughs> I think that that's children. Is, that's such a great horror trope. The creepy yes, ass kid. Yes. I love the creepy ass kid so much. <laughs> you got to write what you know. So <laughs> you got to write. My, okay. Are you calling kid her kid creepy, Jay? <laughs> that's rude, Jay. She says he's asleep is, now. So <laughs> my kid is a tiny ray of sunshine. There you go. You've been saying that. I was putting him to bed once and <laughs> we heard a train whistle and he whispered to me, they're getting closer. So, like, even the most sunshiny <laughs> kid can be a creepy kid. What he meant is the train is getting closer. Yeah. The train cars are coming closer to us. But at the time, I was like, okay, I'm leaving the state. Yeah. I'm, I'm, <laughs> so have you I'm have you gone. woken up with, with your kid hovering beside the oh, bed just staring yeah. at you? Yeah. Yes. About, um, that's terrifying. Yeah. Uh, that happened the other day, except that. So he was like an inch from my face. And I opened my eyes and he's right there. And he goes, Mama, do you want to hear about whale sharks? <laughs> <laughs> and I go, you it's bet. Very important, you know, right yeah. now about whale right sharks. Right this moment, it's three a.m. It is whale shark time. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Mine's about gonna be up multiple times, just standing there, breathing heavily beside the bed, and didn't doesn't say anything until I wake up. Like, get out. <laughs> so yes, kids, kids are creepy. Honestly, the, the inch from my nose is not as terrifying as the standing in the backlit doorway. That <laughs> just a silhouette heart attack instant like yes because you're is... standing there waiting how long do i have to stay here before you wake up notice i'm standing yeah. here you know yeah, that's what it is psychically trying to make me wake up yeah yeah because they don't want to wake you up because then they might get in trouble but if you wake up on your own and they happen to be there it's okay right yeah. exactly they haven't done anything <laughs> absolutely so yes i want to i want to write about creepy children i want to write about a uh, problem parenthood yeah. i would love to mm -hmm. and i have plenty of rage so <laughs> get it all out get it all out so i want to ask so this might be maybe me looking too much into it or not but like the the ritual that the the women in the town go through was that kind of like a, a metaphor for like abortion in a way or am i just reading oh too absolutely much into that? yeah no 100 okay. percent. um yeah bodily autonomy was really like my main thought like mm -hmm. what and it especially like when I was, I was, I was always um, pretty pro choice, pretty pro bodily autonomy. But when I was pregnant, that like doubled and tripled because I did not like being pregnant. Um, I had a really difficult and high risk pregnancy um, mm -hmm. and it got scary sometimes. And I could sit in my body and think, what if I was forced to do this? What would I right. do to get mm -hmm. out of this? Not necessarily even having the child, because I always wanted a child, but the physical pain and constant nausea and like my hip dislocating and things like that, what would I give? What would I sacrifice to get out of this? Especially if someone had done it to me, like if, uh -huh. if someone had done it to me against my will. And that's where the ritual came from. It's like, I would, I would kill a man. <laughs> I would kill a man <laughs> to get out of this. Has gonna let that hang in the <laughs> just sign that, that, that's, a, that's a sound bite for when we promote this. There you I go. will kill a man, I would just kill a man that. tonight. We <laughs> talked to Indiana. Leslie J. Anderson about the unmothers. I will kill a man, I'll kill a man. <laughs> yeah. Um, so but yeah, I, I don't, I don't want it, I don't want to be like this is one to one abortion. Um, this mm -hmm. is an abort, like this in my book is an abortion because it's not. Um, yeah. it, it would be ridiculous to take a 
a concept, an issue that is so complicated and boil it down to this. But I think mm -hmm. the question of bodily autonomy and feeling trapped in your body and like panicking um, mm -hmm. and trying to get out even violently, uh, I think that that is where that parallel is, that I, I wanted mm -hmm. people to, because horror at its heart is all about empathy, right? Like we want to, because fear is, you know, being stabbed. You can be afraid of being stabbed. That's not horror necessarily. Horror is yeah. like, why is this specifically a terrifying idea? Um, and so mm -hmm. the horror element for me was getting readers to empathize with that feeling. Right. So not to go into like the political weeds too much, but with the um, overturning of Roe versus Wade, is that going to impact like the way you write stories in the future as far as if you do include like the, the pregnancy aspect and bodily autonomy and stuff? Yeah, I think um, in in some ways, I, I think of writing a service, you know, I'm, I'm mm -hmm. writing for an audience and I want to reflect that audience's fears and anxieties. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that those have only increased. Um, it, it is it is scary to be in a body that you do not entirely control. Um, mm -hmm. I don't think that that is a, a completely crazy thing to say, especially uh, about horror stories. Um, so I, I feel like I, in some ways, have a bit of a responsibility to not, you know, I, I've now said to my audience, like, I, I've want to tell these stories and I want to continue to tell these stories. Uh, I think mm -hmm. they're important. Um, they're fun. They can be fun too. Um, there's a fun monster. And, yeah. uh, but I, I think also that they are, they are, there's an importance to, to taking apart those feelings um, and analyzing them. Yep. Mm -hmm. So I want to, as far as the monster, like, did you not to give away what it is or anything, but like, were you inspired by anything from like myth or folklore or was it just all your own? let's create this crazy kind of monster thing. Um, I think the, the most direct inspiration was actually the monster from the movie, the ritual. Okay. If, you, if the, you're familiar with that one. Yeah. yeah. It's now such that you, a good now monster. Now that you said fight. that, I could, the antlers, I'm like, yeah, yeah. okay. I could see it. Yeah. Now. So not exactly that. Uh, I didn't want to, obviously like that was not exactly what was in my head, but that feeling of that kind of human kind of animal kind of under otherworldly, but of the forest creature um, that is all of these things at once was was really uh, the main inspiration. My favorite description of it was the antlers and it had like stars in the antlers. I just thought that was so cool. Yeah. Yeah. I. Yeah, good. <laughs> I just, I, I, I want to go off about how cool the ritual is, but that's probably not what we're here. <laughs> that could be another hour. It's you such catch a it now on Netflix. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you, I recommend so, it. Yeah. So the Unmothered is what we're talking about with Leslie yes. J. Anderson for those uh, just now joining us. You guys were talking off air about a New York Times uh, thing. You want to bring that up and, and discuss that? Because I yeah, think I missed I was not on Twitter. I was not on Twitter today. So, yeah. So, um, uh, I can get the exact article title here, but I, um, uh, my book was reviewed in the New York times, uh, today, nice. uh, with two other books as upcoming horror stories for the year. And let's it see a, if I can. Gabino Iglesias is the reviewer, correct? Yes, that is. Yes. And let me see here if I can get the actual title here. Three new horror novels full of terrors that are all too real. Ooh. Did you did you read his review? I did. Yeah, it was <laughs> it was really incredibly nice. And it's funny because earlier in the day he had posted about wanting to do an anthology about mm -hmm. liminal space horror, and I tweeted at him, "I want to be in this," and he <laughs> said, "I'll DM you." Uh, and you then, go, yeah. but I did not know he was writing a New York Times article about me. Uh, so well, he, he, admit, he mentioned earlier this week when we were promoting the show. Did he, yeah, he mention that he? He loved the, 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 read book, so. the book. Right. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. so I, I did send him a message to clarify, like, I want to be in your uh, anthology, even like, regardless of what you, the nice thing that you said about <laughs> <laughs> Like, I, I also think your idea for the book is really cool. Yeah. Uh, yeah he, and I, I've only met him for like a minute once uh, mm, in okay. a green room. So, but he seems incredibly kind and, and intelligent. Well, when you go, when you go back and watch our old shows, you, you'll 
<laughs> we, we, we did talk to him. We talked to him on, on an episode. So is he nice? Yeah, he, Does he... he was. A, he was extremely nice. Yeah. Yeah. It was as for his not his new book, but one before like the Devil All the Time or Devil Call My Name. I can't remember what it's called, but it was for that book, which is also a really good book. Yeah. Yeah, so what, when, you, when, what, when you do your research on the show after doing the show, you'll find the episode. <laughs> Jay, stop it. <laughs> what did, what did it feel like for you personally to have your book talked about in the New York Times? Was that just New like, York Times? I uh, no, I mean, I think one of my friends texted me and I was like, I have no words, only screaming, which is basically what <laughs> I, all I could do for like the like three hours. I mean, it's dream stuff, right? That's the yeah. stuff mm-hmm. of, of like the daydreams that we all have. You know, one so, one day maybe. Uh-huh. So like, did you know it was even like up for the option to be reviewed by them, or is it just like all like a? I'd surprise? heard they had reached out to my publisher to like get the spelling of my name correct. Um, mm-hmm. So we thought maybe. Okay. Uh, but I'm just curious yeah, how like the background stuff worked. If you had any clue or. Yeah. yeah, but no, I did not like nobody reached out to me. I did not know if something was going to happen, what day it would be. It was a complete surprise. <laughs> like it was That's cool. somebody texted me uh, and was like, actually, um, Allison Stein, who wrote uh, Dust, uh, texted okay. me and she was like, girl, you are in the New York Times. And I was like, <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah. And then so I ceased to... the function for yeah. several hours. Yeah. So now you need to print it out and put it on your wall. Frame yeah. It. yeah. Um, I mean, it. yeah. I guess that like it's not in the print, like it's gonna be in the print version, but like nobody's mm-hmm. sure when. So I have a team on it. <laughs> I have a team of, of <laughs> the newspaper. She put together yeah. a team to work on it for yeah. it. Nice. A, a team I, of I dedicated totally would. friends to Google me. <laughs> it, it, it's cool when when anything like uh, any kind of horror novel gets some kind of publicity like that because you know the the big ones you hear Stephen King and and some of the bigger writers but to get some of the you know some new here's a new horror here's a spotlight on three horror you know novels or whatever and you're one of them in the New York freaking times it's a lot of people I I know I mean I just I I keep trying to think of something clever to say about it but it's just incredible like it really is the sort of thing like when I was 10 and decided I wanted to be a writer I thought like oh wouldn't it be neat maybe one day Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. But you don't really like believe that, it's like a hundred percent believe that that's going to happen, and it did. It's crazy. Yeah. It's crazy. You, you're going to get a, a, a huge name that's going to see that list, and they're going to grab your book, and they're going to quote it, and you're going to use that same snippet for all of your books for the future. Just use that same, <laughs> same the same. Uh, what is it? Same blur. Blurb, blurb yes. for every single one of your books for the future. So. Yes. <laughs> You're yeah. made. Yeah, he got it. <laughs> Stephen King says, this looks neato. Yeah, there that's, you all, go. that's all you need, too. Yep. I mean, people make <laughs> careers on that. <laughs> so, yeah, He's been shouting out books recently, and he had, what was it, on CBS or whatever he was the other day? Was he? I, I didn't see it. Yeah, it was some, yeah, talking about whatever his new collection's called. He shout out, like, uh, Tan and Arif Du and Keith Ross and, and some other people, which nice. is really cool. That's nice. good. I always like when you know, the big names are like, all right, it's time to drop some friends. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Everybody go Google the following. Right. Yeah. I, I'm sure that helps. Even, even if he didn't read it, if he just says this book's cool, go check it out. Yeah. yeah. That gets eyes Absolutely. on it. Yeah. 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 And then, and I think that's one of the nice things, one of the nice things of, about entering uh face planting into the world of horror uh, as face I have, planting. uh, Everybody has just been so wonderful. And mm-hmm. like I said, I, I published in, in short stories in horror. Mm-hmm. So I knew that the horror you know, community was, was very welcoming and um, shockingly sweet. Uh, but the extent to which people have been really welcoming and excited yeah. about. The horror community is really, like, really welcoming and nice and stuff. Screw those fantasy people. The horror community <laughs> is. Uh... <laughs> yeah. It's funny because, because like from the outside, people are like, "Oh, they they write about all this they're horror." Like the hell's yeah. angels, it's like the hell of angels of writing, you know? Yeah, they must be terrible people, but they're like they are really yeah. like the kindest people you ever meet. There, yeah. There's so many so many subgenres underneath that horror umbrella that you're going to find somebody that likes something somewhere. So mm-hmm. I think that's why it just makes up a big yeah. community, you know. So. I mean, my theory is that it is the empathy thing. Like to write good horror, you have to understand empathy. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. And to be a good person, you have to understand empathy. And so you get a lot of sweethearts who write horrifying, like, <laughs> awful stuff. 
That's why they're nice in person because they do all the awful stuff. In yeah, the books. exactly. They get it <laughs> out. They're angry they typing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Damn it! So I, his I, I head came off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I do want to ask. You mentioned um, a bit ago that you don't really see too many stories like this dealing with those kind of specific aspects of pregnancy, like the way you approached them. And I feel like, you know, a, a man might have had like the same maybe kind of concept, like the horse giving birth to a baby, but it wouldn't have come out the same way as you writing it. So like, wait, for you, what is like personally the importance of, you know, women's voices in horror? And I feel like in the last, I don't know, I've been kind of in the indie horror scene for like four or five years. I feel like it's been more long. and more like 2019, I think. So like five yeah. years, I think. But anyway, what's like the importance for you of like more and more women are getting out there and getting to tell their stories, like your version of this compared to, you know, like you said, Rosemary's baby is different than, than the way you wrote it. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think that in general, it, it, there is a sense that the horror of womanhood is that it is icky historically mm-hmm. um the horrible mother or the horrible pregnancy um is icky right like there's a grossness to the female body and to female things that is naturally horrific um and not always i think that's often in very schlocky bad horror right mm-hmm. um but i think i think the perspective of what is normal and what is horrific is very different for men and women. Um, Mm -hmm. For example, um, you know, my husband and I have very different ideas of like safety measures when I travel. Um, Mm -hmm. I am very aware. uh, I recently traveled to a city um, which is, is known for having a lot of people on the streets at night. And to me, that made me feel safer because I would be in a well-lit area with lots of people. It made him feel less safe because he anticipated physical violence from this group of people. This is a very Mm -hmm. different perspective. Those are two very, very different threats, but both of them are completely valid and based on our personal experiences. Um, So I think that, that opening up to voices that have not necessarily either been allowed to speak or have been amplified uh, in the past Mm -hmm brings those perspectives in. Um, and, and when I explained that my perspective to him, he like, he completely got it immediately. He understood what, you know, my viewpoint was like, nobody is going to grab me on a well-lit busy street, right, um, yeah. but somebody might fight, start a fight with him on a well-lit busy street in front of a bar. Uh, because mm-hmm. he's a, he's a big guy. He's got tattoos. Like some dude might want to start something to prove something Two totally different, scary situations. Um, whereas I would, I, I often, when I have to travel to Orlando, feel very unsafe because there's a bunch of unlit pads. Hate that. Uh, Uh, that is a different threat. And I think that's the sort of, especially in horror, that's the sort of perspective that you get of, of what are we afraid of and why, um, and, and things that, that aren't a blind, they're, they're a blind, I don't want to say like, I'm trying to say this in a way that is not like men just don't notice. That's not true. There's no yeah. reason to notice it. Uh, it is not in their experience. So why would they? Um, and I think that it can do positive good in the world when we share our experiences. Uh, mm-hmm. This is like a very silly thing to say, but it is it's true. Like it, being able to empathize with each other and to see each other's experiences is important. It also makes That's for more interesting stories. No, no. It also makes for way more interesting stories, though, to get something from your perspective or, you know, someone else's perspective or a person of color from their perspective and what they've gone through. It just, it, no other way to say it, it just makes it more interesting. Like, you don't want to read the same thing over and over again right. told yeah. the same way a hundred times. Like, your story, like you said, tells it from a different perspective than, you know, stories about, you know, creepy kids and pregnancy have in the past. So it's, yeah. It's in the same wheelhouse, but it's different through you know a different set of eyes, which makes it brand new in a way. Yeah, and, and yours, think... yours went even went farther because it's your perspective, but through the point of view of several. Yeah, it, people. it's your race you put oh. in there. That <laughs> right. mad about it. Yeah, um, yeah. I, 
Absolutely. Yep. Do you have any, put you on the spot, do you have any recommendations of other um, horror books or novellas or whatever written by women that you've really enjoyed recently? Um, yeah. Well, Alison Stein's Dust is coming out, like I said. Um, mm -hmm. Sister Maiden Monster uh, by Lucy Snyder. Lucy Snyder. Yeah, I've got the, that's and, over there yep. somewhere on the shelf. Absolutely fantastic. Um, you're putting me on the spot here, man. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, so um, do you read? Do you read much horror? I, I do. You don't have, I mean, I okay. read a little bit of everything. Um, honestly, mm -hmm. this may be weird. I'm, I'm going to forget her name. Sorry. Um, but the book, uh, horror for weenies is, I think an absolute delight. Yes. Um, uh, em Emily C. Hughes. Is that her name? I think, I think that's right. Yeah. I, I, that was a very, um, I believe she describes, um, weird, creepy kids as, um, children with bad vibes, which <laughs> I love. Um, yeah, that's another good one. Uh, the PC wave saying it. <laughs> yeah. The creepy kids. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, not not a woman writer, but a book on a horror book of motherhood. Uh, what kind of mother? Mm -hmm. I really, I oh, just finished that. Oh, Clay, uh, uh, on my mind. Clay, Clay McCloud Chapman. Yeah, yeah, that was that's great. my favorite. That's my favorite book of his. I really like that one. It was weird as hell, and it was, it. <laughs> and it just got weirder. Like I, I kept thinking, I'm like, all right, I got a handle on what's going on. Nope, I do not. I do yep. not have a handle <laughs> what's going. On. Okay, I got it. Not nope, I do not. Um, another book. That uh, again, not a woman writer, because you put me on the spot. Uh, yeah, it's okay. Man, fuck this house is a great parenthood, Brian, motherhood uh, book. Brian Aspen, Aspen right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Aspen Aspen. I really, and I don't know if that's technically horror. I guess it's horror. Yeah, it's it could be horror. Yeah. It's a little silly. It's a little tongue in cheek. Um, but I thought that that was a, a really good, like, taking those uh creepy child haunted house vibes and like yeah. deconstructing it and putting it back mm -hmm. together again i enjoyed that and like the catchiest title you'll ever come across i know yeah, right I know, like, I know. it's so simple so too it's like, man, man, fuck this house. Oh, man, fuck <laughs> yeah just so good i mean it made me pick it made me pick it up and yeah. uh yeah mm -hmm. i really liked it are you a are you a big folk horror person do you like folk horror movies and oh, books yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely uh I really like horror, and this is often for horror, that kind of walks the line between cartoony and horrifying. Uh, like Ravenous would be an example, or Tremors goes a little yeah. bit more over to Goofy, but I love, I love that. I think that's so effective. Uh, and that's I think often, it's something I mean, like, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, like, I think the ritual kind of does that sometimes. Like, it's a little bit goofy when they stumble into that cabin, and it's like so perfectly like like little stick figures all over and like that like that is creepy but it's also like ah oh, come on like this is silly uh and i think they even say that like this is so over the top uh i i, I eat that up i love it makes me think of, like even like um the wicker man and children of the corn they're just kind of a little bit silly at times yeah let's just bunch of kids let's just, again the creepy kids again let's just beat no. the key let's beat the it, creepy it, kids up is he come back and haunt us here that's just yeah <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah yeah so I mean, where, where do we go from here what are, are you doing uh like a tour are you making some appearances you want to chat out where, where can am. people find you my next appearance will be at um uh, talking to you of course <laughs> <laughs> i mean i'm on i'm on the socials yeah. um leslie j anderson writer on everything except twitter where it was weirdly taken um and so i am <laughs> in cat on on twitter um so somebody on Twitter is getting getting praise for your book right now. Well, <laughs> I think it actually there's a um, a painter, a really actually quite talented painter, uh, Le Leslie uh -huh. J. Anderson in New York. I've chatted with her a couple times. Uh, okay. I think she has it, which is fine. She can have it. Uh, <laughs> there's also a baseball player, Leslie J. Anderson. Uh, I will be at uh, Books on the Banks in Cincinnati in okay. November, um, and I think that is my next. That is my last book tour stop uh my book tour is coming to an end uh mm -hmm. i will be in granville in on september 12th um okay. at the granville community center i believe um and i'll be doing a reading with amy butcher who did a wonderful book called mother trucker uh okay. which is <laughs> that's, about, a, that's a good title a, it is a great title it's a nonfiction book about the uh only female ice road trucker Okay. Nice. Okay. Yeah. I've never, I never watched that show, but I've seen those commercials for it all the time. She's not in the show, and she okay. said, and the the 
subject of the book says that those women are like were hired in for the show. Like she doesn't know them. I'm know sure it's completely fake. Yeah. yeah. Right. Right. So she is. She is like a legit like drives the ice road, and you can debate about like, oh, is it you know, is it this ice road or that ice? Road? This, but, yeah. but it's a wonderful book, regardless of of the ice roadiness of it. <laughs> Uh, and a wonderful book about uh, Alaska. So she and I will be doing a reading in Granville um, on September 12th. Cool. Yeah. Cool. The Unmothers is what we're talking about this evening and along with uh, Leslie's other bodies of work. So we can't thank you enough for wanting to stop by and, and hang out with us this evening. Hopefully we're not taking away from uh, anything uh, from too melting. <laughs> yeah, melting in the, in the heat or yep, I'm going laying back to face the down again, crying <laughs> or doing whatever it is you're doing. So. <laughs> Uh, we appreciate you stopping by. Definitely, we hope you come back and talk about your next uh, your book. Happy to. That happens, so, thanks so much for that, having me, guys. Yeah, that's going to do it for all those in the chat and for those who watch this later. Thanks so much for stopping by and uh, hanging out with us and enjoying another episode of Paper Cuts. As always, that's going to do it. Brad, you got anything else? Leslie, thanks for hanging out with us. It was a really cool book. I love the monster in here. I love folklore stuff. Thank you for, I'm so for glad coming on and, and letting, letting us chat with you about your novel. It was, it was really fun. Thanks for having me, guys. This was great. All right. That's a wrap. Until next time, everyone. Love Thanks you, Jay. for joining us. <laughs> I know. <laughs>